Good evening, a very warm welcome to all our colleagues. I'm Anupam Sibyl, President of the Global Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. I work as a pediatric gastroenterologist at Apollo Hospital Delhi and I'm the Group Medical Director of Apollo Hospitals. Just to give you a brief overview on GAPIO, GAPIO is a non-profit organization that was established in January 2011. The aim of our organization is to bring together 1.4 million physicians of Indian origin in the world on one professional platform. This substantial workforce of physicians is a valuable resource which can help to mobilize significant developments in healthcare globally as well as in India. GAPIO now has a presence in 51 countries. I'd like to congratulate AHPI on organizing the Global Conclave 2021. Thank you, Dr. Gyani, for giving an opportunity to GAPIO members to share their perspective. COVID-19 has turned the world upside down. Let's just look at what has changed. Doctors and researchers came together across the globe and unraveled the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in days. Diagnostic kits were developed rapidly. Clinical and vaccine trials were initiated in record time. Our understanding has improved considerably in managing patients with COVID-19. And we now have efficacious medicine and vaccine administration has commenced in several countries. What would have taken at least five years has been achieved in months. And the success of the medical community the healthcare universe needs to be celebrated. In India, more than 40 lakh individuals have already been vaccinated. In the first phase, 30 crore or 300 million Indians will be vaccinated. That is three crores more than the population of the fourth most populated country in the world, Indonesia, and just three crores less than the population of the United States. In this session on global leadership dialogue on remodeling of care, we have a distinguished group of experts from across the globe. Let me first introduce to you our first distinguished panelist, Dato Dr. Jacob Thomas from Malaysia. Dato Dr. Jacob Thomas is Group Medical Advisor of Ramsey Saim Dabi Healthcare Malaysia. Dr. Jacob has served as the president of the Association of Private Hospitals of Malaysia and has been an active council member of the President's Council of Kapio. Dr. Jacob is the chair of Joint Commission International Board of Commissioners, the United States, and has been an advocate of high standards in patient safety. May I invite Dato to share his perspective on radical remodeling of healthcare? Thanks, Dr. Anupam Sibal, for the kind introduction. And thanks also to the Association of Healthcare Providers of India, AHPI, and the Global Association of Physi Physicians of Indian Origin, GAPIO, for giving me this opportunity to be a speaker during this wonderful conclave. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce you to the radical remodeling of healthcare under this program of Global Leadership Dialogue on Remodeling of Care. Now, we can look back at the healthcare challenges over the ages. We had the Spanish flu, we see this in history, we had the plague, we have AIDS and HIV, we had H1N1, we had the Ebola, and each of this, we thought half or quarter of the population of the world will be eliminated. And currently, we have COVID-19 pandemic. So what does this mean? We also had global disasters, World War I, World War II, we had the Middle East crisis, and we had the what we all remember very vividly, the 9-11 strike in New York, which was very, very uh, uh, devastating and such a shock. So in all these instances, 
we had to in our own way reset the way we move forward and even now we have to reset just like what we did after 9/11 the global changes after the reset during 9/11 there were more stringent border and travel restrictions especially for air travel immigration laws became more stringent visa tourism all that was hampered selected nationalities were not allowed into some countries and medical tourism was reversed and travel reverse medical tourism travel became a norm usa was less accessible for medical personnel and medical tourists and it became less attractive and asia has emerged or developed into the new preferred destination why reset now current healthcare systems are not designed or were not designed to deal with this current covid-19 crisis an unpredictable large scale health challenge that requires urgent mobilization of resources and effects whole population this pandemic is also diametrically opposed to the direction that healthcare systems particularly in developed countries have been taking over the past years now we have to focus resources on non communicable chronic diseases such as diabetes and cardiovascular conditions going forward the burden of chronic health problems especially among the elderly will far exceed infectious diseases this is a fact people over 65 will represent more than 11.8% of total populations by 2023 the number of people living among chronic diseases with diabetes is projected to increase by 48% to 629 million by 2025 the next point is driving efficiency shifting care from hospital to outpatient settings today's patients are fearful and reluctant to be admitted to hospitals in france the number of overnight hospitalization beds decreased by 4.2% while outpatient care beds increase by 7.4% in home hospitalizations increase by 3.4% in the us hospital revenue from outpatient grew from 30% in 1995 to 47% in 2016 in england the outpatient attendances increased by 21% from 2012 to 2016 now what about how we incentivize innovation for smaller unmet needs and vulnerable populations primarily increasing relative focus and spend on specialty care rare disease patients make up less than 0.06% of the us population and less than 0.05% in the eu and less than 0.04% in japan in contrast worldwide often drug sales are expected to have doubled over the 2019 to 2024 period by 2024 often drugs are projected to make up 1/5 of worldwide prescription sales amounting to us 242 billion dollars oncology is also expected to have almost a 20% share of the worldwide market by 2024 limit investment in overall prevention In 2015 less than 3% of healthcare spending went to prevention in OECD countries this has remained stable over long term 
However, nearly 50% of prevention spending was on healthy condition monitoring programs, such as checkups and dental examinations, 25% on health promotion, while both immunization and screening programs accounted for less than 10% each. This raises a question on resource allocation. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in my short discussion, I have a few conclusions that we need to harness innovations such as social networks, open source systems, and the sharing economy. <clears throat> we have to implement network governance through interconnected institutions spanning government, business, and civil society. We need a reformed or a refocused WHO, a World Health Organization. We need to have better handling of global health information. We need better global quality of healthcare. And finally, we have to together manage our high and rising healthcare costs. And again, what we need to do is to reset like how we have done in the past and look at a new norm and a new future. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope uh, you have a good day. Thank you, Dato, for an excellent presentation. May I now invite my dear friend, Dr. Sudhakar Janalagada from the US to speak on maximizing the impact of healthcare around the world. Sudhakar is an American board certified internist, has both certification in gastroenterology and hepatology, and works as a gastroenterologist, hepatologist in transplant hepatologist in Georgia. Dr. Sudhakar is currently the president of the American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. Over to you, Sudhakar. First of all, I want to thank you, Dr. Siebel, for a kind introduction. I am grateful to Association of Healthcare Providers India, AHPI, for organizing its AHPI Global Conclave 2021 on radical remodeling of healthcare, which is very relevant and timely topic for the healthcare providers to maximize the impact of healthcare around the world. Representing American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, the largest ethnic medical organization in the United States. I'm excited to be a part of this great conclave and share my thoughts on global leadership dialogue on remodeling of care. The COVID-19 pandemic had made it clear that ensuring affordable and timely access to the healthcare is a priority for all. It has shown us the limitations of each country in combating healthcare crisis as the pandemic has impacted almost every aspect of the life on earth. As the pandemic began, it quickly became apparent that public policy and current healthcare system were ill-prepared to deal with the challenges of pandemic. Providing quality and affordable healthcare remains a challenge. Healthcare system are facing one of the most challenging times in the recent history. Developing countries have been working on agenda to have a universal healthcare coverage for their population to ensure that affordable and safety healthcare is made available and accessible for community at large. During the course of past year, an unprecedented health crisis we have looked out for the innovative ways to mitigate and prevent the spread of the virus, prevent diseases, and strengthen the support system while seeking the modern way addressing the healthcare needs of the patient. We have now come to depend on technology and social media and telehealth as a way to meet the need of our patients. The digital revolution has transformed many aspects of the life who need to understand and appreciate how digital technologies are being harnessed 
for the public health response to COVID-19 worldwide. As the pandemic began, it quickly became apparent that public policy and healthcare system were ill-prepared to deal with the challenges of pandemic. Providing quality and affordable health care remains a challenge. The pandemic has exposed the vulnerability of the scientific research and public policy. Since the pandemic began, we looked at innovative ways of mitigating and preventing the spread of the virus while, seek, while seeking modern ways to address the health care need of the patient. The digital revolution has transformed many aspects of the life. Some healthcare organizations are using improved working conditions, alternative to employment models, example, virtual and contract and gig, and innovative technologies to anchor cost-effective and next-generation talent models. Many countries are trying to offset the workforce shortage by providing incentives to attract foreign talent or to encourage healthcare professionals to work in remote regions. Digital technologies can supplement clinical and laboratory notification through the use of symptom-based case identification and widespread access to the community testing and self-testing and with automated and acceleration of reporting to the public health database. There has been increasing interest in decentralized and digitally connected rapid diagnostic test to widen the access to the testing and increase the capacity and ease the strain on healthcare system and diagnostic laboratories, public health organizations and technologies companies are st stepping up efforts to mitigate the spread of the misinformation and prioritize the trusted news sites. For example, Google SOS, alert intervention prioritize the WHO and other trusted sources at the top of the search result. There are few reports about the impact of this intervention and difficulties in defining a misinformation for health plans, hospitals, and health system. 2021 will likely be year of consumers or at a minimum. The year of the greater consumer influence. While in USA, Congress and the administration has been pushing for the more intraoperability -operab and greater price transparency for drugs and for hospital costs, these changes are actually being pushed by or at least inspired by the consumers. Healthcare systems need to work towards the future in which the collective focus shifts away from the treatment to prevention and early intervention. In order for us to meet these new needs, and requirements. As a leader at every level, we are committed to fostering a culture of listening, learning, empathy, and compassion, holding our organization each other accountable by defining the cascade of measurable roles, goals, and providing update on progress. In our efforts to work together as a leader in healthcare industry, to create a new healthcare system, global leader needs to be. Number one, we need to stay informed and ahead of the curve. Effective communication with people all backgrounds, including people in other sectors is vital. One need to anticipate changes in business and work in a proactive manner, rather than a reactive if possible, in order for us to bring out changes in the effective manner. One need to be ambitious with foresight to make changes that are needed. And finally, be open to the listen, learn, dialogue, discuss, and enrich one another, which are essential for growth, to bring out about changes in healthcare policies and delivery. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, any physician who are used to caring for a patient with the most critical illness in the hospital displayed the complexities of diagnosis and management in clinical medicine. One of the most difficult and rewarding aspects of the field is allowing fear and uncertainty during the time of great changes. Adaptation for patient. In the midst of all these, 
there is hope scientists have turned the unprecedented crisis that the pandemic is into opportunities nowhere is it more obvious than a vaccine research giving birth to numerous and reliable vaccines around the world the saving millions of lives it is a vindication for human will power dedication and seeking the common good of the whole world technologies such as cloud computing 5g artificially artificial intelligences natural language processing nlp and internet of medical things can help streamline the healthcare delivery and align it with changing consumer preferences increase use of data as a platform to extract insight from patient data will be area of interest for most healthcare players as virtual healthcare increases in capable capability and popularity in organizing will likely need to continue investing in security tools and service to identify risk and keep them at bay it's nice to be reminded that in tough times there is still happy surprises and that humanity is stronger than the disruption or the perils that we encounter we shall overcome all the hurdles and come out stronger main goals particularly in indian subcontinent strengthening the primary care which is very important american association of physicians in indian origin working to initiate family practice program in india which is very important to strengthen the medical system it is easy to access to the primary care physician from the community prospect the precision te- precision technologies like robotic and proton therapy very important in referral hospitals again thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you all thank you thank you sudhaka for sharing your perspective i would now like to invite a third panelist dr pallu mawala to give a perspective on how australia has evolved its healthcare system given the challenges pallu holds a postgraduate degree in ophthalmology from ahmedabad she is the current president of the australian indian medical graduates association she is the founder of the rosewell hill surgery practice in sydney she is actively involved in community health awareness programs and has been instrumental in raising funds for breast cancer research through several organizations pallu hello everybody i am dr pallu malawala and i represent emga which is the australian indian doctors uh, association i am very grateful to dr anupam sharma uh, anupam sibal here for uh, being a great moderator and uh, i am also grateful to Uh, the association of healthcare providers and gapio for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, this topic now this topic remodeling of healthcare is a very important one and as you all know no no healthcare system is perfect and how we have evolved over these years is a very important thing and i would like to give you the australian perspective of how the healthcare system has evolved because um, australia has got one of the best healthcare systems and it's ranked 8th in the world we over here have to talk about two eras in the australian history one is the pre medicare system and the other post medicare system so this medicare system is i mean pre medicare system let me talk to you about that first before it was a fee for service type of system where people used to patients used to go to their doctors get charged pay them for their service go to the hospital system pay for whatever there is this way the it was a, it was very hard for the people because uh um, people would get bankrupt just by going to the hospital now after the medicare medicare is a system where uh, it is free healthcare for all 
it's not actually free because it is paid by the government, which in, in turn, the people pay for it. But it is a socialist system where everybody pays according to their income and everybody gets the health system, uh, health care, uh, which is a very good health care that we have in Australia. Now, this Medicare covers GPs and specialist expenses. It covers public hospital stay expenses. It covers essential medicines to a certain extent, of course. And it covers also a part of the physiotherapists, dietitians, audiologists, and psychologists costs. It also covers aged care and palliative care. So it's a very good healthcare system that we have. Now, in turn, it, we also get some preventive health cover in Australia, which was not there before. All this has come over time. So we've got free childhood immunizations, immunizations for aged care. We've got breast screening and mammogram programs, national bowel screening program, diabetes screening, cardiac assessments. And also from now, all COVID, COVID immunizations will be free and offered to all Australians. So these are the things that um, is involved in uh, evolving healthcare. So let me tell you that no healthcare system is perfect, but we are one of the best. So uh, now what I need to talk to you about is how evolution of healthcare globally has come about. It's not only Australia, it's everywhere where the, the doctors have got more training there is, uh, there is evolution of diagnostic equipment like MRI, PET scans, which we never had before. There are surgical procedures now where before, when after a joint surgery, the patients used to be like immobile for days and months. But now, um, uh, even after major surgeries, even a major cardiac surgery, major joint replacements, uh, patients are mobile within days. That's because of the doctor training, the new procedures, the new uh, innovative, uh, you know, uh, implants, things like that. Um, the very important healthcare system over the years, the evolution has been in electronic health records in the hospitals and in all private practices, including the GPs and the specialists. And um, this has made things very easy because all health records are now can be shared and there is more communication between GPs, specialists, hospitals. Uh, and so that has worked out in making the healthcare system much better. There is skill enhancement of doctors and multitasking. So before histopathologists could not do biopsies. Now they do their own biopsies and read their own reports. Also interventional cardiologists can give joint injections. Um, so all these doctor skill, multi-skill um, you know, practices have improved healthcare and it's good for the patient over the years. Especially this healthcare system over the COVID era in Australia uh, there are many changes that have come by and we live in strange times and this has this healthcare system uh, about uh, we've now got telehealth we've got video health we've got emails to consult patients more than anything else there is a broadening of the my health records my health records here is an individual health record for each person and so if a person living in Sydney is going to be admitted to a hospital in Tasmania, uh, they can access the patient's health records because it is all on the, on the internet. And it can be accessed by any hospital or any doctor in Australia if the person so wishes. Better communication between hospitals, GPs and medical specialists Discharge summaries reach the GPs now very quickly from the hospitals. So uh, when the patients come to you back from the hospital, you know exactly where you, what is happening to that person rather than wait for a, 
uh, letter to come by post and often things would get missed. Also, we get medical reports downloaded on medical software. Nowadays, in the COVID era, we are sending electronic scripts to the, to the pharmacies directly or to the patient's phone. The patient gets it as an SMS message and by clicking on it, it comes up as a QR code and the person can take it to the pharmacy and get their scripts. Another important change that has happened for the better is there is uh, now the prescription has come with only the active ingredient prescribing. So only the generic name can be written for the medicines, not the, uh, you know, the trade name and which was confusing for the patients, because nowadays the focus is more for the patient taking over their own care. We are encouraging patients this time, rather than coming to the surgery, to take their own blood pressure, to take their own weights, to do their own blood sugar levels. So once they report that to us, then uh, you know there are less chances of them coming into the surgery, and you know less chances of the COVID spreading. Also, increased home care services for aged care and disability groups have come by. Um, I know that in India, there is the EICU and the E hospitals coming to the homes, and that's a great um, change for the better as well. So really, in an ideal world, what is an ideal world for the healthcare system? It is something where there is excellent, easily accessible healthcare to one and all. This is what we call utopia of the healthcare system. Hopefully, we can achieve this ideal world for our grandchildren, our children, and everybody else to come in the future. Before I end this talk, I want to tell everybody that Sydney is a very beautiful place. And once this COVID is over, we encourage all of you to come to Sydney and have a look at our beautiful harbor, and we will look after you. OK, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Palu, for sharing with us your perspective. Now, may I invite our fourth panelist, Professor Dhavnendra Kumar from the United Kingdom. Professor Kumar is director of the Genomic Medicine Foundation and consultant in charge at the Genome Clinic, Spire Cardiff Hospital. He's an honorary professor at William Harvey Hart Research Institute, London, an honorary consultant in clinical genetics and cardiovascular genetics at Arts Heart Center in London. Professor Kumar will talk to us about new generation genomic diagnosis in precision medicine and healthcare. Thank you, uh, Professor Sebel. It's a great honor to be invited to speak at the AXPI Global and Conclave 2021. I'm going to speak on the next generation genome diagnosis in precision medicine and healthcare. I'm based at uh, the William Harvey Research Institute of the Queen Mary University of London. Uh, that, is part, uh, that is part of the Bars and London School of Medicine. I acknowledge the uh, input of many of my colleagues in different places and also uh, literature sources, which I've used um, in my presentation. So first of all, um, there are the few emerging paradigms in clinical medicine. These are called P's of medicine, personalized medicine, precision medicine, predictive medicine, preventive medicine, preemptive medicine, participatory. They are all part of the emerging uh, paradigm of genetic and genomic medicine specifically genomic medicine, which is basically the core for the personalized and precision medicine. In most cases, we are dealing with polygenic disease, what you also call complex and common diseases. So we have set off uh, uh, genes in the genome, called susceptibility genes and modifier genes, 
and then they interact with environmental factors. So the underlying aim is the, the precise diagnosis and precise therapeutics. Currently, we have got many avenues of genetic diagnosis in different disease groups, which are part of our clinical genetic or clinical genomic practice. As you can see under the lab testing heading, there are many investigations now which are all based on genome diagnosis, such as RACGH, whole, whole exome sequencing and RNA sequencing, and GVAS. I'll touch upon that briefly later in my talk. First of all, the very important method called RACGH, also called microchromosome array analysis, it has replaced the conventional cytogenetic. We do not now carry out the G-bending um, uh, chromosome analysis as we used to do. However, we have maintained fish diagnostics and also occasionally a conventional chromosome karyotyping in, in some reserve cases. So this method, also called RSEGH, is very important to, 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 to appreciate. Uh, basically, it has got, we, we use a patient DNA and make a single standard and also single standard reference DNA and then hybridize and then look at what part of the chromosome or any chromosome is missing or extra material. The, any upsurge is called DNA gain and any loss is seen as a downsurge or DNA loss. That's seen on the computer. Say for example, in this case, we investigated a child with developmental learning problems. What we found that a tiny loss of the short arm of chromosome nine missing in this case, as you can see. So the report also um, comes along with detailed annotation or description of that specific segment that is uh, lost in this case. And it gives us a, a good, good idea what aspect of genomic functions are absent in this case, and that would aid in the diagnosis uh, and also, also give us a long-term prognosis. And this is a good example of precision diagnosis. And based on that, we can plan management and long-term care. For example, in this case, you can see a child which has, the child has got and the 22 deletion syndrome. And this also called velocardi facial syndrome or DGR syndrome. And this uh, many different um, genes are missing within the 22Q deletion segment. And they all require multidisciplinary care. As you can see, different specialists are involved in the care. More importantly, the pediatric cardiac surgeon, because these children have congenital heart anomalies such as phallostatology or um, complicated aortic arch abnormality, and they require open heart surgery. And uh, this is a beautiful example of how we could uh, employ genome diagnosis in, uh, in clarifying the diagnosis and as well as guiding the precise management. Moving on to the uh, genome sequencing as such, uh, we have got um, now, because of technology improving, and the computational uh, power also vastly improved. We have got a set of uh, genome sequencing mo modalities or platforms. We call it next generation sequencing. The most important is the clinical exome sequencing where we focus on clinically relevant genes that are important for the given phenotype. For example, a child presents with a myopathic picture or neuropathic picture or, or a, or set of congenital heart um, anomalies. Then we can just focus on those uh, specific genes. And conventionally, we have got five to six, seven genes in total, and we can target that, and we can look at exons within that, within those genes, and work out which particular gene or genes could be involved. Moving on, we can also carry out the whole exome sequencing, whereby we can look at all coded parts of the genome or exomes. These are about 20,000 in total, roughly about 2.1% of the whole genome. And in cases where they, we have got no clue or there is a, the complex phenotype 
because of multi-system, multi-organ involvement. This technique is very helpful, especially in children with multiple malformation syndromes and uh, system, multi-system uh, manifestations. The, finally, we have got the whole genome sequencing that is an emerging paradigm and hopefully it will replace say, uh, gradually next four to five years. Um, the underlying uh, advantage of um, gradually, gradually reducing cost is, is very important. However, we are not yet ready for whole genome sequencing, primarily because we have, we have not fully annotated all genome variants, mainly in different populations. So most of the data is derived from uh, white uh, European origin people uh, or some Hispanic people or Afro, uh, Afro-American people. And that's why it, it is limited. And once we have got a whole genome sequencing carried out and we have got set of variants in say Indian population, we have difficulty in uh, analyzing or interpreting. And it, this slide shows <clears throat> the the dilemma between uh, a variant, whether it is disease causing or path pathogenic or non-pathogenic, as you can see, we have to annotate each and every variant very carefully. And we have got guidelines now um, uh, generated from the American College uh, Genetics and Genomics Working Group, in which many uh, pe people contributed. However, and the, and the these guidelines probably might not be that uh, uh, effective or efficient for patients coming from uh, South South Asia or, or far, far Eastern Asia Pacific countries. However, we, we do have gold standards, but these require uh, constant re revision. The other other avenue in uh, precise precision genomic diagnosis is the pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics. That is probably an important when it comes to pharmacotherapy or prescribing. So the difference between pharmacogenetics and genomic pharmacogenomics is, is, is that we, in pharmacogenetics, we deal with the specific genes which have got the modifying drug response, whether it is an adverse drug, drug response or, or positive favorable drug response. Examples include mitochondrial DNA testing before you prescribe gentamicin or aminoglycoside antibiotic because of risk of deafness. And G6PD um, associated with primary queen sensitivity in malaria, RYR2 mutation in malignant hyperthermia with when there is a family history, and uh, drugs uh, given in um, long QT syndrome uh, with the background of uh, potassium ion channel uh, genes. And in the warfarin uh, therapy, the uh, interpretation of VK, VKORC1 and CYP2C9 um, genetic uh, profiling is, is very important. And most of these are now recommended by the, by the FDA and other regulatory bodies. It, when you come to pharmacogenomics, we have got a number of genome variants scattered across the genome. They offer collective information on the susceptibility of protective response to drugs, anesthetic agents, stents, interventional devices, probably many, many other medical and surgical agents. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic has given a lot of opportunities to, to look at the pharmacogenomics in, in, a, in a real way. And that is some, that's the big area for future research and application. <clears throat> This is the global overview of the effect of genomic profiling in precision medicine. As you can see, we can there are multiple um, aspects of precision genomic medicine. One of the most important applications is the clinical oncology, where you can do the tumor um, genome profiling and work out what specific uh, changes would be uh, would guide us for a specific very expensive drug selection. So currently in the UK, we, we are doing it uh, in four different um, cancers, the um, triple negative breast cancer and the ovarian cancer uh, and the colorectal cancer, uh, malignant, um, uh, malignant melanoma. And, uh, and of course, lung cancer, may mainly the non-small cell 
the small cell lung cancer. And this, this is a very important development and that is important for all medical oncologists before they consider prescribing very expensive uh, protein kinase inhibitor class of drugs. Surgeons are also using now genome profiling to, to, to guide their surgical outcomes. So this one, um, uh, this slide shows um, uh, a number of breast cancer profiles using different um, uh, genetic um, genomic kits. And IDI is, is uh, really the prognostic value of these things. Similarly, in the colorectal cancer, um, there are other uh, uh, genomic kits are used and also for prognostic importance. So the, 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 apart from the medical application, the, even surgeons are now finding genome profiling or genome sequencing useful in their surgical practice. So surgical oncologists by and large are very positive about employing both uh, at the tumor level and also at uh, the germline um, level to guide their surgical uh, intervention. So the key message uh, which I, have, I would like to convey to, the, to my colleagues is that genome diagnosis is the final point for efficient and effective delivery of precision in medicine and healthcare. Genome diagnosis has got many avenues, including microarray, chromosome analysis, and different types of genome sequencing. However, very important to, to consider carefully annotated, carefully selected phenotype of the patient. And the genetic and genomic testing for precision and personalized pharmacotherapy is emerging and now approved by many regulatory bodies. Most importantly, genomic medicine is a multidisciplinary uh, uh, approach uh, aiming for personalized and precise management. And we have to remember and guide us always the six Ps of the modern medicine. Thank you. If you've got any questions, I would be glad to answer. Thank you, Professor Kumar for sharing your thoughts on how genomics is progressing. I'd like to thank Dato Jacob, Sudhakar Palo, and Dhavnendra for taking out time for this session. Jacob highlighted the challenges and offered suggestions on the way forward. Palu gave a brief but brilliant overview of Australian healthcare and the emphasis on prevention. Sudhakar shared his perspective while working in the United States, the country that saw numerous challenges and has, to its credit, so many solutions that are being used globally. Dhavnendra gave us an insight on how genomics will radically change medicine. COVID-19 saw geographical barriers break. The Global Indian Physician COVID-19 Collaborative was established by GAPIO, API, BAPIO, CAPI, the Australian Society, and since then, several other societies have come on board. The Physician Collaborative not only addressed clinical needs, but also emotional well-being when we had the good fortune of being addressed by His Holiness, Sadhguru and Sister Shivani. The spirit of cooperation that we see today will help us find answers. We will be able to work together towards establishing a more holistic approach to healthcare, better medication and newer vaccines. Our learnings in developing the COVID vaccines will open the door for fast tracking vaccines that have been in the making for, for years, if not decades. We will find newer solutions to age old problems. Together, we will. Jai Hind.